when uh, we came into this world, we came into a world that was just absolutely filled with signs. It still is. Everywhere you go, there are signs showing something, okay? In fact, I would guess that if you walk from this room right here and you go out to any of the parking lots, that on your way you're going to pass 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 signs, depending on the route that you take. Because all along the way, on every wall, there's a sign. On, even hanging from the ceiling, there are signs. Uh, we know that on every door, there's some kind of sign de designating it. We know that there are signs all over. And they are there for a reason. They direct us. They give us information. They prohibit us from doing something. And one of the things that I wanted to do was maybe just to show you a few signs. So if we could have... Uh, uh, the screen come up, I'll show you a couple of signs that I discovered. Some signs are just mysteries. Here's a sign that's in Tibet. No one is a gamma in the land of llamas. Take it easy. I don't know what that means. Uh, but for somebody, it meant something. Some signs really are, are to save our lives when you look at them. Here's one that's in the Falkland Islands at, decades after the war, but it's still hanging on a fence. And I would think that I wouldn't want to climb over that particular fence because there's the sign. Some signs really are just strange. Uh, let me go back here. Here are two signs. One of them says what not to do because people will burn their hands and knees on the floors, but the other one says it's closed anyway, so you can't do that. So it really doesn't matter. Some signs are just offensive. Speed limit, men 140, women 35. So... Perhaps just a little bit chauvinistic in that one. Some signs are just uh, uh, right. Uh, you know, it's a china shop, and you are not allowed to bring your elephant into this place, and, and we know why. And then some signs are just confusing. Entrance only, but do not enter. I'm not quite sure what they want us to do at this place. And then there are some places that have a sign that says you can't do anything in this location. I want you to look closely. I mean, you can't do anything in this location. Some signs are just worrisome. We have a sign. Whoops, let me go back. We know where you live, and you can see the lady up there. She's concerned about that because that's on the side of her building, and somebody knows where she lives. Sometimes I wonder, do we really need this sign? Really? I mean, who is going to do that? Some signs... This is probably West Texas. The rabbits are going to cross the road, and the rattlesnakes are going to be there as well, so be careful when you get there. Sometimes we just don't really know what they mean. Please take care of the sleeping grass. If I knew what that was, I promised that I would take care of it. Here's a sign that could come from Mississippi, Texas, Louisiana. Uh, Junior's Hog Farm is coming this way, and we needed to know that it was there. Uh, there are other signs, to be honest with you, that just need... A vowel. I, I, I'm just not quite sure. This is obvious in the western United States. We even have signs that tell us that this is the end of the road. Clearly this is. You must stop. You cannot go left. You cannot go right. You cannot go backwards. You cannot go forwards. It sounds like uh, uh, books that we've read. And then if that's not the end of the road, this is. End of the earth, two miles. I worry about Houghton, which is another two miles down the road. <laughs> So I'm not quite sure about that one. And then this one, this is why we teach English at Washita. Somebody really needed some help. And then maybe my favorite sign of all is just this one. Thank you for noticing this new notice. You know, your noticing has been noted and it will be reported to the authorities. So signs, even these signs, when you look at them, we have to think, okay, somebody had a meeting. And somebody decided we need a sign here to tell us something, either what we cannot do or what we can do or which way we need to go or some important message that needed to be communicated. Whatever it is, that's the kind of signs that these are. And they sometimes are paid attention to. We look at them. Sometimes we don't look at them. Sometimes we're annoyed by them. Sometimes there are too many signs. We're just not quite sure. But what's interesting for me is that when you get into the book of John, and by the way, I'm going to preach the reason we didn't read a text is I'm preaching the whole book of John. And we really just don't have that much time. And so we're going to look at John's gospel, which is centered around seven signs. 
John chose to tell his story by, telling the, by using these seven miraculous signs that he moves along the story. But each one of them is there for purpose. He's trying to tell us something. Now, John's an interesting gospel in many ways, partly because of his vocabulary. You know, if you read John, you have vocabulary, life and death and light and uh, 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 darkness. And, and all of these contrasts are there. But also, even the way he talks about the miracles and these seven signs. There is a word that's used in the other Gospels fairly frequently for miracles. It's dunamis. But John never uses that word. The word means mighty works, but he never uses that word for his miracles. Another word that's found in the Gospels is tarata, which means wonder or miracle. John only uses that when he combines it with his favorite word for the signs. He uses the word simeon. And Simeon is translated simply a sign. And sometimes he'll say miraculous sign, but he always designates these seven things as signs from God. When you have a sign from God, obviously it's to signify something, to teach something, to direct us in a certain way, to tell us something that's very important. And that is exactly what John is trying to do. And so the question comes to us, okay, what is John trying to say to us through these seven signs? And then, what are we supposed to do with those seven signs? And so, I want us to take a few minutes today and just walk ourselves through these signs. And by the way, you can expect when I have opportunity that we'll be preaching on these seven signs as we come up in the next weeks, like next week. And, and I want us to see these signs one at a time and really begin to understand them. So, let's look at the seven signs in John. The first one that we have is water into wine. John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. You know this story. Jesus has been invited to the wedding at Canaan, Galilee, uh, and his mother's even there, so it must be a family friend. While he's there at this big festival, and weddings were a big deal in, in the, that century, when they were there, they ran out of wine. And so his mother came to him with this problem and told the servants to do whatever he says. And they brought to Jesus these big 30-gallon containers. They were for ceremonial water. And then Jesus turned them into wine. And the head of the banquet came and said, wow, this is the best that we've had. Most of the time that comes early. And then later you get this, but you've saved the best for the last. That says something, by the way, about Jesus, okay? And then it says at the end of that miracle, that first miraculous sign, by the way, he says this is the first miraculous sign. First can mean priority or it can mean the very first. I don't think it's priority because we're about to get to some bigger ones. I think this is the first one to show the glory of God, and that's what it says at the end of that miracle. The second sign comes in uh, 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 John, the fourth chapter, and that is the healing of the royal official son. The royal official has a son who's sick and dying, and he comes to Jesus and he says, please come and heal my son. Jesus uses this, by the way, as a little opportunity to say, until you see signs, you're not going to believe. But this man is persistent, and Jesus tells him, go back. And when you get there, your son is going to be healed. And when he got home, he realized that at the time that Jesus said that, that was the time that his son was healed. Jesus has power over the illness that his son had. The third sign is the healing of the invalid at the pool of Bethesda. And that sign is found in John the fifth chapter. And in that sign, what we find is a man who for 38 years has been an invalid, and he's coming to the pool of Bethesda for this reason. They believed that an angel of the Lord would, would disturb the water, and when that happened, the first one in was going to be healed of whatever malady they had. This man had been there trying to get in, but someone always beat him to that. And so Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? And of course he did. He's been there for a long time. And so Jesus takes this man and heals him. And the man who's been for 38 years in a position where he probably couldn't walk there walks away from the pool of Bethesda. Jesus had power over his condition and his situation. Jesus was powerful. And then we have the feeding of the 5,000 in John the 6th chapter. And in that chapter there, Jesus has a large group of people around him. It says 5,000 men. It probably could be called the feeding of 10,000 or 15,000 because it doesn't count women and children. 
And it's the end of the day, and they need to eat, and there's no food except for two fish and five loaves. And Jesus feeds everybody that is there, and they have 12 baskets left over. And then they begin to say, whoa, Jesus can feed us. And they begin to follow him, trying to make him a bread Messiah and try to make him do that again and again. He has power to do things they had never seen before. And then we have the fifth, the walking on water. The fifth sign occurs in John, the sixth chapter as well. And in that sign, Jesus' disciples are in a boat and there's a storm. And they're trying to get to the shore. And the text says that Jesus came walking on top of the water right to them. So he is doing something that in nature does not happen. And he gets into the boat with them. And the text also says that immediately they were to the shore. He has power over nature. And then the sixth sign is the healing of a blind man, chapter 9. The man has been blind since birth. He's never seen. And they are asking, is it his parents' sin or is it his sin? What made this happen? And so Jesus begins to heal him, he spits on the ground and he makes the mud with that, with that dirt and spit and he puts it on the eyes of the man. And he says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man does that and for the first time ever, he sees. And I wonder if some who saw that were thinking to Isaiah's messianic prophecies where he said, and the blind will have sight and they will see. And then the last This is why I don't think the first miracle of water into wine was first in priority. Because the seventh one is the raising of Lazarus, Luke, uh, John, the 11th chapter. You know what happened. Lazarus was friend and he died. And Jesus heard about it and he waited four days before he got there. And then when he got there, he began to teach Martha and the others around. He says, listen, I am the resurrection and the life. And everybody who believes in me will have eternal life, and that's okay, but she's worried about Lazarus right now if you'd only come. And so Jesus calls him forth out of that tomb after he has the stone rolled away. And Jesus has power over death itself. Seven miraculous signs that John uses to move the story about Jesus along. And so we have to ask, okay, what is he trying to say about Jesus? What is this trying to signify? What did he want the original readers of this gospel to know and to understand? What does he want us to know and to understand? And I think it's this. The clue is in that first one. In that very first miracle, the changing of the water into wine, at the end it says, and the glory of God was revealed in this event. And the glory of God was revealed in connection with Jesus. So immediately they know somehow Jesus is connected to the glory of God. And then they come to realize with the other evidence and the other signs and the other direction that John is giving them that he's not only just connected with God, that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God, and that he is God himself. And so what John is trying to do through these miraculous events is to show us that Jesus is indeed who he says he is. In fact, in the 20th chapter, he comes to say in verses 30 and 31, he says, And listen, I have included these so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may come to have eternal life. That's the reason for this. I wanted you to know that Jesus is Lord over nature, that Jesus is Lord over life, that Jesus is Lord over death, that he is the ultimate one. He is Lord of the universe. I wanted you to understand that and to know that. And so I have given you this evidence, and the evidence is stacked one upon the other until you get to seven. By the way, there will be one more, the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the end. These are the signs that were meant to signify to us a very important truth. Now, when you see these signs, then you have to ask, okay, what should my response be? Every time you see a sign, am I going to go that way? Is this the door I want? You're going to make a response. And that is what John was intending. He was intending that someone would see the signs and read about the signs, and they would then respond to Jesus Christ in faith. The signs are 
the important information that we need to make a decision. Rico Tice is a British evangelist and wrote a, a book called Honest Evangelism. Rico talks about a time that he visited some friends in Australia, and while they were there, they took him on sightseeing tours, just like we do. They took him to Botany Bay. Now, he's from England. Every time you go to the water there, it's usually cloudy and rainy and cold. But he's at Botany Bay in South Australia, and he's looking at it, and it is spectacular and beautiful. And so Rico just starts taking off his shirt because he thinks he's just going to go for a swim. And his Australian friend says, what are you doing? He said, well, I thought I would just take a swim. It's a beautiful day, beautiful water. And his Australian friend said, what about the signs? Rico hadn't even noticed the signs. And he looked over and it says, danger, sharks. And actually, if you look at those signs, they're pretty elaborate about the danger of sharks in that time. And being a confident Englishman, he said, oh, don't be ridiculous. I'll be fine. To which his friend said, listen, mate. 200 Australians have died because of shark attacks. Now you have to decide, are those shark signs there to save your life or to ruin your fun? But you're of age, you decide. Rico did not swim that day. It's a wise decision, I think. But I think that's exactly what John is doing in this gospel. He's laying out all the signs and the evidence of who Jesus is, and he's saying... You have to decide, are these signs intended to save your life? And let me tell you, they are. They are the signs that tell you that one has come, the only one, who can truly save us from our sins, who can truly save us from the death that we are experiencing, that can truly save us and give us eternal life. Now, one of the questions that we would want to ask then is, how did they respond you look at the rest of the gospel and you begin to look at what's happening as people are seeing these signs or they're noticing what John is trying to say. So I want us to look at that. You would guess there are two responses. Some will not believe even though they see the evidence and some will. So let's look at those who don't believe. Now this is in the midst of the gospel and if you look you find those who didn't believe the truth. In John 6:66 6, it says that those who had listened to Jesus watched him change, uh, use the bread and the fish to feed all those people that they from that time on decided that they would not follow and they turned away from him. Really? Here's what happened. They were wanting him to keep giving them bread and keep giving them fish and Jesus said, "No, no, you don't understand." I am the bread, and it is my blood that will make the difference. And that was too heavy. And they walked away from that. They could not get that. And then in the 10th chapter, verse 30, this is a time when Jesus talks about being the shepherd. And it says that they did not believe him. And in fact, they turned belligerent. They started to try to stone him. They decided that they didn't want this man around anymore. And then in John, the 11th chapter, in verse 53, after they had watched Lazarus come out of the grave. Now, of all the, the evidence, this should have been the top one. But the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees saw this as a danger. He's ruining our life. He's destroying our situation. And look what they said. Better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. So from that day, they plotted to take his life. And he's headed toward the cross at that time. And then last, 1237. And in this one he says, even after Jesus had done all of those miraculous signs, they had seen them all. In his presence, they still would not believe in him. This shouldn't surprise us. It happens still today. There are people who have heard the gospel. There are people who have seen the gospel as it is lived out in the lives of those who are believers. There are people who have been exposed to it and still they're saying no. I will not believe. They are still saying no. Now, I would say, look at the evidence again. <laughs> look at what John has to say. Look at what Jesus has done. And look at the people around you. But still, there are those who say no. There are those, by the way, who still have never heard. And they have not come to faith in Jesus Christ either. So it is an evangelism call for those who need to hear it. 
Then there are those who have believed. You look at the text and you find that that changing of water into wine in chapter 2, verse 11, at the end of that it says that his glory was revealed to them. But this is what's interesting. Then it says, and they put their faith in him. We're talking about the 12 disciples here. Well, they already had put their faith in him. So what's happening? They already believe, but now with more evidence, they believe even deeper. That happens to us all the time as Jesus works in our lives and we believe a little bit more than we did before. And then in 453, it says, after he had saved the official's son, when the official got home and he saw the miracle that Jesus had performed, he saw the evidence and he believed. And it says that he and all of his family began to follow Jesus then. It was the message that was necessary for them, the sign that they needed. And then in 1145, chapter 11, After seeing what had happened, when Lazarus came out of that tomb, the text says, remember, that some didn't believe and started plotting his death at that time. But it says also that some of the Jews who had seen what he had done began to put their faith in him on that day. There are those who see the weight of the evidence, the stacking up, as John put it, and they see he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. I must believe, and they have come to believe that. That represents most of the people in this room today. Most everybody in this room has seen all the evidence you need, and you have come to believe Jesus Christ, he is the Christ. He is the Lord. He is the Son of God. He is God Himself. And I know that the only solution for me is salvation through Him. John stacked it up. He believed it was there. And he expected people to make a response. Now, what does it say to us? Let's get to this audience. We come to what I think is the message of the ages which John has presented. And in the message of the ages, he's going to really make two calls to us. The first is an evangelistic call. And if you look at John, the 20th chapter, and verses 30 and 31, this is what you read. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. By the way, the other gospels record more miracles, but John just selects these. So we find that he's very selective in the ones that he's putting together. But he does it for purpose. He says, I have written these that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, here's what we're saying. John's purpose was evangelistic. He was saying, let me show you who Jesus is. Let me give you the evidence. Let me indicate through the signs who this man really is. And then when you have that, he expected that you would come to a decision. And you would say, I believe. I know that there are perhaps those in this room who have heard this before. And if you've never heard it before, you have today. You have heard the gospel presented that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He came to save you. He is the only solution. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He is the bread of life. He is the light of life. John has all of that to say. And you have to this point not believe, but I encourage you to look again. Look at the evidence. Consider what the Spirit is telling you, and this is the day. It's an evangelistic call on your life. Come to know Jesus as personal Savior for the first time. But there is another message here, and it's a missionary message. And if you look at Philippians, the second chapter, verses 15 and 16, then you see how how Paul will come off of that. And he will say, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God. That's the people who have come to believe. And as blameless and pure children of God, those who have come to know that he is the truth. And then he says, who are without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. People, we are around people who do not know that truth. But since we do, he says, then you are the people who hold out the evidence. You say, let me show you why you should believe. Let me show you in my life. Let me show you in the gospel truth. Let me show you through the scriptures. This is why you should believe. It's a missionary call to every believer. Go and give the evidence of the truth about Jesus.
I'm convinced that John was expecting response. And today, the response that John would expect in the gospel is that if there's one in this room who's never given their life to Jesus, and by the way, you saw three beautiful testimonies of people who came to know Christ as their Savior. Their life has changed. You saw the smile on their face. Everything has changed. If you'd been in the first service, there was a seven-year-old who walked the aisle. She was brimming, smiling from face, all over her face because she gave her life to Christ. She discovered the evidence is true, and she wanted to be a part of that. If you're here today and you have never done that, this is the day that you need to give your life to Christ. It is also the missionary call. So others of us may need to respond, Lord, I need to be more faithful in making sure that that evidence is out there. It's in my life. It's in the truth that I share with my words. It's in the truth that I share through the text. I need to tell others that this is true. We know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts today. And we are going to allow a response. We're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to stand here with some other staff. This is the time that as the Spirit moves in your life, you make the decision that God is calling you to make. As we stand together, pray with me at the beginning of this invitation time. Father, in this room, your Spirit is speaking to some hearts. You're speaking to someone who, as of this time, has not said yes, has not believed the evidence, has not believed the signs, has decided not to follow them. But I pray this is the changing time. This is the turning point. This is the time that they will say yes, and they will believe. I pray, Lord, that there are those in the room who, uh, who are looking for a church, and if they are looking and they find this is the church, I pray that you would move them to join, that this is the place that they need to plant their life. And Father, I pray for all of us who are believers that you would put it on our hearts that this missionary call is on us, that what you have done, what you have shown through your Son, Jesus Christ, it is the truth, and we must witness the truth. In your Son's name we pray, amen.